Hello everyone, welcome to Historically Accurate. In my last episode, I talked about that in the reign of Duke Xiao of Qin, the great-great-grandfather of Yi Ren, Shangyang, a man from Wei State, helped Duke Xiao of Qin to reform. He abolished the traditional hereditary nobility system and replaced it with the new nobility system of 20 rank titles. All Qin people had a good chance to change their destiny by being rewarded with nobility titles for their military achievements or farming contributions. Such an incentive policy immediately gained support from the vast majority of Qin people, and Qin's national power was significantly improved. After the first success, Duke Xiao of Qin encouraged Shangyang to continue implementing further reforms. The second set of in-depth reforms were implemented 10 years after the first set of reforms were launched. The second set of reforms focused on institutional change. First, Shangyang took back the land from the nobles and distributed it to the serfs who were actually cultivating the land. He also allowed trade in land, which made privatized land legal. The slaves who previously had to depend on the nobles became farmers with their own land. Second, since the nobles no longer owned fiefs, Qin State divided its land into multiple counties and established local governments to manage local affairs. In this way, the king had greater control over the entire state, making it easier to mobilize resources. Such a hierarchical governance system has been adopted by many modern countries until today. Third, Shangyang standardized units of measurement and used strict measurement method to measure land and grains, making taxation more convenient and fairer. At the same time, the unit that the Qin people were taxed on changed from certain amount of grains per mu to a certain amount of grains per family. One purpose of this change was to force all the people to reclaim and manage their own land. This helped change the previous situation in which a lazy person could still survive without working if he or she depended on another person who owned a large amount of land. In addition, Shangyang began to transform customs of Qin people. He also moved the capital to Xianyang, which was closer to the east. Qin people used to have many barbaric customs, such as injuring or killing other people without being punished, occasional incest, cousin marriages, eating uncooked food, or burying the wives and concubines alive with their husband when he died, etc. These customs had a negative impact on population growth and health of Qin people. They had an even greater negative impact on stimulating individual enthusiasm for agricultural production activities. After these customs were transformed, Qin people overall became more civilized. Population grew rapidly and comprehensive qualities of Qin people were improved significantly. While moving the capital to Xianyang, which had a convenient transportation system, showed Qin's ambition to start connecting with the rest of the world. Shangyang's reforms achieved unprecedented results in the end. Qin State was completely refreshed and its power was significantly improved. This was how Qin State started its rapid growth of national power. After Duke Xiao of Qin passed away, Shangyang lost his protective umbrella. He was executed by the next ruler, Qin Hui of Qin, to quell the resentments among the nobles whose interests had been harmed by Shangyang's reforms. But Qin Hui of Qin wasn't stupid enough to overthrow the previous reforms. After all, the king of Qin benefits the most from those reforms. I have spent so much time talking about Shangyang's reforms because I want to make it clear that all successes are the results of accumulative advantage. 
Successes can't be achieved overnight. It seemed quite abrupt that Qin Shi Huang defeated the other six states within a decade, but in fact, it was the accumulated national power, which was achieved in the past a hundred years by the six kings before him, that helped Qin Shi Huang win so easily. This is also true for our lives. Most successes can't be achieved without working hard continuously in the right way. Perhaps this is the wisdom that learning history can bring us. Now let's go back to Ying Zheng's time. With the efforts of Ying Zheng and the six kings before him, Qin State had become a superpower with nearly one million troops. Ying Zheng decided to start carrying out his plan to unify China. Qin's first target was Han, the weakest of the other six states. When Han heard that Qin was going to send troops to attack it, it immediately dispatched a special envoy to Qin and stated that Han was willing to become Qin's vassal state. It also offered to cede Nanyang County to Qin. Ying Zheng accepted Han as its vassal state. He also accepted Nanyang County offered by Han and immediately sent a previously surrendered Han general, Teng, to take over Nanyang County. The next year, Ying Zheng ordered Teng to lead 100,000 troops to attack the capital of Han, Xinzheng. The king of Han was captured after weak resistance and the territory of Han was renamed to Yingchuan Commandery, which became the stronghold to defeat Chu states later. Since then, the six eastern states lost one. The second target of Qin was Zhao. There were numerous wars between Qin and Zhao in the past hundred years. As a state more powerful than Wei, Zhao had always been the main anti-Qin force in the six eastern states. In 260 BC, about 30 years ago, Bai Qi, a famous general of Qin, led 600,000 troops to annihilate the main force of the Zhao army in Changping. Bai Qi ordered 200 of the surrendered Zhao troops to be buried alive. Zhao was weakened significantly by this battle and could no longer fight against Qin alone. Qin had no rival since then. The Battle of Changping was also an important battle in Chinese history, and I will make a video about it in the future. This time, Ying Zheng sent Wang Jian, a very experienced general, to lead 400,000 troops to attack Zhao from three directions. In addition, he sent Meng Tian, a young general, to lead 200,000 troops in the north to guard against raids by the Huns. While Zhao sent Li Mu, its best general, as the commanding general, and Sima Shang as the deputy general to resist the Qin army. Li Mu had previously won glorious victories in the wars against Qin. Wang Jian was afraid of Li Mu's strength, so he sent spies to spread rumors that Li Mu and Sima Shang were going to rebel. As a result, the fatuous king of Zhao dismissed these two generals and replaced them with two more mediocre ones. Li Mu was killed soon after that. As soon as the Qin army got the news that Li Mu was replaced, it launched an attack and soon took Handan, the capital of Zhao, and Zhao was conquered. The remnants of Zhao fled to Dai and established a government in exile and a new state, Dai State. After Handan was taken, Ying Zheng went back to the place where he had grown up. Then he ordered all the people who had mistreated him and his mother, Lady Zhao, to be buried alive by his soldiers. The third target of Qin was Yan in the north. Yan often clashed with Zhao and its national power wasn't as strong as Zhao. Therefore, Qin initially planned to annex Yan peacefully. However, Yan pretended to surrender to Qin, but at the same time, it was preparing for the war together with Dai state. The Prince Dan of Yan sent an assassin, 
Jingke to assassinate Ying Zheng in the name of providing the map of Yan. Unfortunately, the assassination failed in the end. This is the most famous assassination in Chinese history, and it has been documented in the Shi Ji, records of the Grand Historian. I may talk about it in detail in my future videos. Qin had given up the plan to peacefully annex Yan since Jing Ke attempted to assassinate Ying Zheng. Wang Jian led a large army and defeated the allied force of Yan and Dai at one stroke. Yan was conquered. The king of Yan and the king of Dai fled to Liao Dong, and Wang Jian sent Li Xin, a young general, to pursue them. The king of Yan killed the prince Dan and gave his head to Li Xin in the hope that Li Xin would stop pursuing them. But it didn't work. It was the heavy snow and extreme cold weather that prevented Li Xin from continuing his pursuit and gave the king of Yan another four years to live. In 222 BC, the remnants of Yan and Dai were killed by the army led by Wang Ben, the son of Wang Jian. The fourth target of Qin was Wei. Wei was a powerful state in history. At one time, Qin had to cede its territory to Wei for peace. But in Ying Zheng's time, Wei had become a weak state. In 225 BC, when Wang Ben was suppressing the rebels who were originally surrendered Han people, he also conquered more than 10 cities of Chu. Wei happened to be near Wang Ben, so Ying Zheng ordered Wang Ben to conquer Wei and clear the way of Qin to attack Chu. Wang Ben led an army to besiege Daliang, the capital of Wei. The walls of Daliang were extremely solid. Wang Ben came up with the strategy of directing the water from Hong Canal to flood Daliang to force the king of Wei to surrender. As a result, Wei was conquered. After the four states of Han, Zhao, Yan, and Wei were conquered one after another, only Qi and Chu, which were the two most powerful states of the six, remained in the east. Ying Zheng decided to conquer Chu first, so he asked his subordinates how many troops were needed to conquer Chu. Li Xin said that only 200,000 troops were needed to conquer Chu while Wang Jian said that 600,000 troops were needed to conquer Chu. Hearing this, Ying Zheng laughed and said that General Wang Jian was old. So he gave Li Xing 200,000 troops to attack Chu and appointed Meng Wu, another experienced general, as the deputy to assist Li Xing. Chu sent General Xiang Yan to lead his army to fight against Qin. Chu was vast and sparsely populated, so Xiang Yan adopted the strategy of luring the enemy by letting Li Xin and Meng Wu conquer many cities at the beginning. When Li Xin and Meng Wu joined forces at Chengfu, Xiang Yan sent troops to secretly follow the Qin army. After following the Qin army for three days and three nights, the Chu army launched a surprise attack when the Qin army was totally unprepared. The Qin army was badly defeated. Qin failed the first attempt to conquer Chu. For the second time, Ying Zheng didn't dare to be careless. He mobilized all the national resources to make Wang Jian lead 600,000 troops to conquer Chu at one stroke. Before Wang Jian set off, he asked Jing Zheng several times for fertile land and beautiful houses as rewards. Ying Zheng found it strange, but he still agreed. Afterwards, Wang Jian's subordinate asked him, As the leader of the national army, why do you care about those land and houses? Wang Jian said, Now I control almost all the main forces of Qin. The king must be suspicious of me and afraid that I might rebel. I can only eliminate his suspicion by asking for more land and beautiful houses, because the king will think that I have no ambition to replace him, and therefore I won't rebel. 
Wang Jian believed that the morale of Xiang Yan's army must be high since they just defeated Li Xing's army. Therefore, after Wang Jian's army arrived in Chu, Wang Jian ordered the soldiers to stay in their camp and didn't launch any attack. Xiang Yan's repeated challenges were completely ignored by Wang Jian. The king of Chu accused Xiang Yan of being timid and repeatedly ordered him to attack. Xiang Yan had no choice but to attack. But Qin troops defended their positions firmly and the Chu army's repeated attacks all failed. This situation lasted for several months. The Qin army was still able to feed the soldiers and the horses thanks to its strong national power, while the Chu army had to retreat because they ran out of food and fodder. When the Chu army were retreating, the Qin army launched an all-out attack and defeated the Chu army at one stroke. Xiang Yan was also killed. Wang Jian seized the opportunity to take Shouchun, the capital of Chu. The king of Chu was captured and Chu was conquered. The last of the six states, Qi, was the farthest away from Qin. Therefore, for a long time in the past, it hadn't cooperated with the other five states to fight against Qin. The king of Qi himself and most of his ministers were also pleasure seekers. After the other five states were conquered, Qi had no fighting spirit even though it had over 70 cities. In 221 BC, Wang Ben's army marched south from Yan to attack Qi. At the same time, Qin also kept bribing the prime minister of Qi, Hou Sheng, to persuade the king of Qi to surrender. Under the heavy pressure, the king of Qi had to surrender without a fight, and Qi was conquered. It only took Ying Zhen nine years to completely conquer the six eastern states. In this process, the Qin army had an absolute advantage in terms of military strength and logistics. Even so, as long as there was a chance to win without fighting, the Qin generals would never miss it. Examples of such include conquering Wei by flooding its capital, Daliang, and pushing Qi to surrender by bribing Hou Sheng to persuade the king of Qi. It is important to know that the Qin soldiers were all brutal and always ready to rush up and behead the enemies. The fact that they were able to resist such a strong desire to fight shows that the Qin army was in strict control, and there must have been decrees rewarding those troops who won without a fight. Yun Zheng built a unified empire so quickly, but the fast collapse of the empire was also beyond everyone's imagination. In my next episode, I will talk about how Yun Zheng destroyed his empire step by step. See you next time!